Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 814 for April 12th, 2020. Coming up in a few minutes. In some cases, it might be a nurse where we're sending two masks to. In some cases, it might be an entire fire department or entire police department or an entire hospital. And so it's been really, really interesting. And uh, our our team is staying quite busy. (laughs) Hundreds of distilleries around the world are producing alcohol for use in hand sanitizers and disinfectants to fight the coronavirus pandemic. Uncle Nearest's Fawn Weaver is doing that along with writing a lot of checks to buy N95 respirator masks at market prices to donate to first responders and healthcare workers around the U.S. And at a time when businesses are laying off workers right and left, she's not only keeping her entire staff employed, but hiring some of those laid off by other companies to expand her team. I'll talk with Vaughn Weaver on Whiskey Cast in depth. That's just ahead along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice, and much more, all on this week's Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Italy was one of the first countries to see a major outbreak of the COVID-19 coronavirus, and until this week, it had the highest death toll of any country from the pandemic. This weekend, Italy recorded its lowest number of coronavirus deaths in three weeks, and while that is a sign for optimism, the country will remain on lockdown until at least May 3rd. That has forced the cancellation of the Roma Whiskey Festival in Rome, which had already been postponed once because of the pandemic until April 25th and 26th. Carlo Duto is the festival's promoter, and he's on lockdown at his home just outside of Rome. If you live in the um, in a house in a, you know in the city and um, uh, it's far uh, from a, a garden a park, it's really tough. I've got the very big luck to stay in the countryside, just outside Rome. So I've got a garden, a nice loving cup. I've got some London dry gin in the fridge and some liquor ice so I can survive. But the Roma Whiskey Festival is not going to happen later this month, as you'd hoped. Yes, it should have been held uh, in March. In first, uh, first, um, the first dates were that in March, uh, but then it was changed unt- uh, to the 25th of April. Uh, this was still at the end of February, uh, when we didn't know that it would have been so long. And then now we have still to uh, reclose uh, these dates. So um, we still don't know when it will be programmed uh, in 2020. We hope to, to do it in 2020. Uh, for sure, but to say the word sure is really uh, uh, tough to, to use. Uh, there should be the Roma Bar Show in October, first days of October, 4th and 5th. Uh, last year were more than 10,000 people, big success. And maybe at this Roma Bar show, uh, we'll have um, a section all uh, dedicated to the whiskey. We are still uh, thinking about it. And Just you'll bring it back for next year, though, right? Otherwise, for sure, uh, always, <laughs> for sure, uh, it would be next year or uh, should be in February or in March, yes. Uh, because it's, uh, it has now become the biggest uh, uh, whiskey event in Italy. And so there was a big, um, uh, ex- big expe- expectations this year. Uh, there are always uh, big uh, uh, presentations of new products uh, distributed in Italy. 
um, big numbers of distilleries, also independent ones, um, from all over the world. Other event updates from this week. The Spirit of Toronto Festival has now been postponed from June 5th until October, and the American Craft Spirits Association announced this week that its annual convention has been rescheduled for August 7th through the 9th in Portland, Oregon. We'll go through other event changes in a few minutes during our Calendar of Events segment. In other news, coronavirus news overshadowed some executive changes at Diageo. Deirdre Malin will retire as president of Diageo North America at the end of June. After 19 years with the company, she has led the North American unit since 2015. Malin will be succeeded by Deborah Crew, the former president and CEO of Reynolds American. Crew joined the Diageo board last year as a non-executive director and is stepping down from that position immediately. She'll take on the new job July 1st. Meanwhile, Diageo's Global Chief Marketing and Innovation Officer, Syl Saller, is also retiring at the end of June after 20 years with the company. She was named a Commander of the Order of the British Empire, or CBE, in the Queen's New Year's Honors list earlier this year. Christina Diaz-Andino will take over as Chief Marketing Officer July 1st. The economic impact from the pandemic is hitting drinks company boardrooms worldwide. Diageo told stock analysts this week that it's pulling back its sales and profit forecasts for the rest of the year. While the company will pay its April stock dividend to shareholders, it is suspending plans to buy back nearly $6 billion worth of shares over a three-year period. While retail sales in the U.S. and Europe have showed slight gains during the crisis, as people stock up their homes, the shutdowns of bars and restaurants in many countries have cut into overall sales. Bernard Ricard has estimated that the pandemic could cut its quarterly profits by as much as 20% over the same period last year, while Remy Cointreau projected that its operating profits for the current fiscal year could be off by as much as 30%. Pennsylvania's 600 state-owned liquor stores remain locked down, and the state system's online sales are sputtering, but another control state is taking steps to help consumers. Virginia Governor Ralph Northam gave the state's distilleries and restaurants the green light to offer delivery service and takeout cocktail service temporarily. Distilleries can deliver two mixed drinks per delivery or takeout order, while restaurants can offer four drinks, as long as there's a meal sold for every two drinks they sell. More awards to report on this week. The American Distilling Institute announced its annual winners for both craft distilled and merchant bottled spirits. Triple Eight Distillery on Nantucket Island in Massachusetts took home the Best in Class Award for American Whiskies with its The Notch 15-year-old single malt. That's a sweep for Triple Eight, which won the Best in Class Award last week for its The Notch 12-year-old in the American Craft Spirits Association competition. Great Southern Distillery in Australia won Best in Class for International Whiskies with its Lime Burners Heavy Peat single malt. And Merchant Bottled is the term that ADI uses for sourced whiskeys. Texas's Milam and Green Distillery won the Best in Class Award for those whiskeys with its Ben Milam Barrel Proof Straight Bourbon. We do have a bunch of new whiskeys to mention this week. Law's Whiskey House in Denver is releasing a new six-year-old bottled in bond rye whiskey. It's made with Colorado-grown San Luis Valley rye, it's a 50-50 mix of malted and unmalted rye. I received a sample the other day. I'll have my tasting notes for it soon at whiskeycast.com. And speaking of rye, Minnesota's Far North Spirits has released the first batch of its Seed Vault series with eight different rye whiskeys. Each one is grown with a different type of rye. The whiskeys were all distilled and matured identically to test the difference that each varietal has on the whiskey's flavor. Those whiskeys are now available on the East Coast at retailers in Maryland and the District of Columbia. The final batch of seven additional ryes will be out this October. 
Virginia Distillery Company is out with its first single malt, made exclusively with the distillery's own spirit. Courage and Conviction American Single Malt is matured in a combination of ex-bourbon, ex-sherry, and cuvee wine casks. Once again, I'll have tasting notes for that one soon at the WhiskeyCast website. India's Amrut Distillery now has two new U.S. exclusives available. Atma is a six-year-old peated single malt matured in a port wine cask. There's also a rare single-grain Amrut available in the U.S. now. Amrut acquired a cask of spirit distilled from 95% corn and 5% malted barley from another nearby distillery and matured it in its warehouses. Just 108 bottles will be available in the U.S. for around $100 each. I've reported for a number of years now on the vintage Hammerhead single malt whiskeys made in what is now the Czech Republic back during the late 1980s, back before the Iron Curtain fell. Now, the oldest Hammerhead yet is available exclusively in the U.S., Raj Saberwal at Glass Revolution Imports worked with Hammerhead owner Stock Spirits to get a 30-year-old single cask bottling. 220 bottles will be available at a recommended retail price of $425 each. I've also mentioned the single malts of Scotland range from Elixir distillers before, but those whiskies have generally not been available in the U.S. until now. Impex Beverages has imported 10 different whiskies in that range, from a 10-year-old Kalila and a 12-year-old Linkwood, to a pair of 30-year-old single malts from Glenrothes and the old Imperial Distillery in Speyside. There's also a new U.S.-exclusive 18-year-old Port Askeg single malt from Elixir Distillers as well. Two years ago, we introduced you to Australian distiller Craig Crafty Field, and his Craftworks Distillery in Capertee, New South Wales. Crafty and his distillery barely escaped the Australian wildfires a few months ago, and this weekend he released three new single malts. Toke OK was matured in a heavily charred French oak Toke wine cask. The Capertee Cellar Door release number two comes from a mix of bourbon, Chardonnay, and Batritas wine casks. And I love the name on his third one. Grumpy Old Man on a Hill is his first peated single malt. It comes from a single bourbon cask. Unfortunately, those malts are only available in Australia for now. Finally, there are a lot of sad people in the whiskey industry this week, mainly in Canada, but also in Scotland and other parts of the world as well. You see, Jay Wheelock, Jeremiah, by birth, was a fixture in Canada's whiskey community for the last two decades. Jay was a sales rep and brand ambassador for Edrington, White & Mackay, Ben Riach, Compass Box, and other brands over the years, and had been working with Vancouver-based Fontana Beverage for the last few years. You couldn't attend a whiskey festival in western Canada or pretty much anywhere in Canada without running into Jay, he had not only an extensive knowledge of whiskey, but the enthusiasm and passion that helped him teach so many people about whiskey over the years. Jay had a fall at his home last Thursday and died in his sleep overnight. He is survived by his wife Katie and their two children. Please join us in sending our condolences to them and all of his friends. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, where they're making hand sanitizer as well as whiskey right now and donating it to hospitals and first responders, the hand sanitizer that is, to help fight the spread of the coronavirus. Heaven Hill urges you to join the fight. Stay home, stay safe and enjoy one of their 360-degree virtual warehouse tours, along with guided tasting experiences, and Season 1 of the Tales from the Hill podcast. You'll find them all at heavenhilldistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. I hope you'll join us this week for our live webcasts on Wednesday and Friday. 
We've been doing the webcasts for a few weeks now on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Periscope. Our Friday night happy hour webcast the other night had a panel of master blenders with Billy Layton, Dr. Don Livermore, and Stephanie McLeod. This week we're going to do a live version of the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel on Wednesday at 5 p.m. New York time. If you've followed me on social media for any length of time, you know that one of my other passions is auto racing, specifically IndyCar. Our panelists will be the 2016 Indianapolis 500 winner, Alexander Rossi, IndyCar race winner and Dancing with the Stars runner-up, James Hinchcliffe, and the producer for their Off Track with Hinch and Rossi podcast, Tim Durham. Turns out they're all part of a group within the IndyCar paddock who enjoy bourbons, and there's even a bourbon tasting club in the paddock. So I pulled a few hard-to-find bourbons off the shelf for them to taste during our webcast on Wednesday. Now, on Friday, we'll have another one of our happy hour roundtables with award-winning drinks writers David Wondrich and Noah Rothbaum, along with blogger Billy Abbott, and at least one of the Scotch Test dummies depending on their real-life work schedules. That's coming up Friday at 5 p.m. New York time, 10 p.m. London time, and 2100 GMT elsewhere in the world. And if you have suggestions for someone you'd like to see on one of our live webcasts, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to send in your ideas. We'll see what we can do to make it happen. Time now for the calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distillery. There's an old saying about skeptics taking things with a grain of salt. Well, get your salt shaker out because just about everything on this list is subject to change depending on when governments allow events to resume. And the plans for these events could change at any time. So don't make any travel arrangements until you've confirmed things with the event organizers. As of now, the first Whiskey Festival still announced as taking place for now is Whiskey Live in Tel Aviv, Israel, May 13th and 14th, followed by the Whiskey Classic in Morristown, New Jersey. It's still set for May 14th as of now. But given that state officials in New Jersey have been expanding their public health orders this weekend, that date is tentative at best. McTeers in Glasgow, Scotland has suspended its live auctions until further notice. But if the governments allow it, their next whiskey auction is scheduled for May 22nd. The Somerton Whiskey Festival, set for May 30th in St. Albans, England, has now been changed to a virtual festival that will take place online that day. Check the website for details. And as of now, the Whiskey Obsession Festival is still set to take place in Tampa, Florida, June 4th, followed by Whiskey and Barrel Night in New York City on June 11th. We're updating the calendar of events at WhiskeyCast.com as soon as we get details on postponements and reschedulings. If you're putting together a whiskey event and need to make some changes, please use the contact form at WhiskeyCast.com to let us know about your plans so we can let the whiskey community know. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of Virginia's most awarded spirits, including the Roundstone Rye and Rabble Rouser Bottled in Bond Rye. They do it all with renewable solar energy. In fact, you can actually see how their solar arrays doing in real time at their website, CatoctinCreekDistilling.com. The search never ends. But it's nice when you can come in for a landing, pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey, matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast in depth is brought to you by Mortlock. Over the last month or so, we have mentioned some of the distilleries who have switched from making whiskeys to alcohol for use in hand sanitizer and disinfectants to help fight the coronavirus pandemic. We've only been able to scratch the surface, though. According to the Distilled Spirits Council, as of now, at least 700 U.S. distilleries are making alcohol-based sanitizers for use by healthcare workers, 
first responders, and in some cases, the general public. And that doesn't even begin to count the other distilleries around the world doing the same thing. Major distilling companies have also donated collectively millions of dollars to help the hospitality industry get through a time when the bar and restaurant business has essentially cratered. This week, Fox Business reported on a slightly different way that one whiskey company is responding to the pandemic. Now, I'd be willing to bet that before COVID-19 came along, 95% of us who work outside of health care and maybe a few other fields had never heard of an N95 respirator mask. Now we talk about them like one of the most widely demanded products on the market, because they are. Uncle Nearest Tennessee whiskey founder Fawn Weaver has become an expert on the demand for N95 masks, because she's been buying them on the open market for weeks now and giving them away to first responders and healthcare workers who very badly need them. As you might expect, her phone's been blowing up these days, but I finally got through to her Thursday afternoon. Let's talk about the masks. A lot of distillers are donating alcohol, but you don't have alcohol to donate yet, so you came up with something much more needed, correct? Actually, we are also creating, we are also making sanitizer. So remember that we have a co-distillery in Columbia, Tennessee, where we have been laying down our barrels for two and a half years now. And so plenty, plenty, plenty of alcohol <laughs> heads and tails that were there to utilize for this because the second largest producer of Tennessee whiskey behind Jack Daniel is uh, Tennessee Distilling Group, where we co-distill. So Nears Green Distillery has its own office, its own everything there in Columbia, Tennessee. So, no, we're also delivering sanitizer. The difference is, is that we are delivering sanitizer directly to the local hospital. So we've not been sending anything out messaging or anything like that, the VA hospital reached in and said, hey, we need this. Can you get this to us? And it's like, yep, out the door. So that on the sanitizer side, we are still doing that. You just don't see it online. Uh, the N95 mask, we began purchasing those uh, March 1st. I, I, I posted a note to our team. I said, listen, I know that the government is saying we don't need masks and the only people that need masks are healthcare workers. But I am looking at this and, and I think that they are one going to reverse that decision, which they now have, as you know, is that I think they're going to reverse that decision. But also I think our people are going to need masks. And so we began purchasing when the prices were up there because we knew hospitals wouldn't purchase at that price. The government wouldn't purchase at the price, but individuals would, which means that the government and and hospitals arguing with the manufacturers over price gouging was not going to cause them to lower the prices. It's just that individuals all over the world would have these masks, but the people on the front line would not. So we began buying them and setting them aside. And uh, as soon as we had enough, then we posted to our whiskey family on our both our Facebook and our Instagram and said, if you are on the front line at a hospital or a medical center, send us a, a copy of your badge, email us a copy of your badge or business card that shows the address of the medical center, and we will immediately get N95 masks out to you. And so we've been sending out hundreds of packages every day for the last uh, couple of weeks. And you've spent $40,000 on these masks so far, uh, right? A lot more than that at this point. That was the original part. <laughs> We have, uh, we've spent quite a bit more than that. We actually have another 5,000 masks arriving on Monday, which will immediately go back out. We're negotiating another 10,000 masks. And, you know, the key is, is making sure that we're working with suppliers that we know we're not selling fake masks. And there's a lot of, got, a lot of them out there selling fake masks. So that has complicated it quite a bit. And the good news is, is because we were so early and making these bulk purchases, then we know which suppliers are supplying the real mass. And uh, we, we get them in and, and we send them right back out. The thing that's been interesting is, is in my head when I said, let's protect our whiskey family. And those are the people that are online that are always so supportive of us. We knew there has to be people in the medical field, probably quite a few of them. And we know that they likely aren't being protected because if they're not a doctor or a top nurse, that what's happening right now, when the medical supplies go from the government into the hospitals, there is a top-down approach, which makes sense, and I get it. 
But what ends up happening is, is beyond the doctors and the top nurses, a lot of the folks below that are not receiving PPE. And so they're in the hospitals, they're still working with patients, and they're getting sick. And so what we figured was it is likely that a lot of those those folks below your top doctors and your top nurses, that some of them are in our whiskey family as well, but the folks that are below them, those guys that aren't protected are likely the ones that have been supporting us from day one. And let's see how many it is. And I got to tell you, I am absolutely shocked at the uh, responses that we've received because it is fire chiefs and police department chiefs and anti-terrorism unit chiefs and that are all responding to our post and saying, hey, we're a part of your whiskey family and we have massive needs. So in some cases, it might be a nurse where we're sending two masks to. In some cases, it might be an entire fire department or entire police department or an entire hospital. And so it's been Really, really interesting, and uh, our our team is staying quite busy. <laughs> They're staying quite busy with shipping out masks, that's for sure. How did you get your hands on so many masks? I mean, hospitals are having trouble doing this. The government is clearly having some issues with it, and you managed to figure out how to get your hands on them. Yeah, well, I think what they're having issues with is the prices. So it's not that they can't find the mask, it's that the manufacturers are price gouging. So they're going back and forth and arguing over the prices of these masks, which is understandable. If you are a business, if you're a government, you know that these masks should only be, you know, $3 and they're asking you for $10 for them. I mean, some of the masks that we have got, some of the N95s that we've got that are cloth have been as, as much as 18 bucks which is absolutely insane. And in a normal world, in a normal environment, you absolutely should not be paying those kind of prices. And for the government where you're having to secure millions of them, then it is different. But if you think about the the state of Massachusetts, you see what they did, where they reached directly into a supplier through the Patriots and said, listen, you use your connections, which is the same thing we did. We use connections within our whiskey family, said this is a need who is a supplier or who's within a supplier. And because of their commitment to us and what we were doing, our own whiskey family said, all right, uh, one of the main ones that we've gotten 15,000 of N95 masks from was is a part of our whiskey family, has supported us from day one. And after we paid these uh, crazy prices in the very beginning, going through suppliers we didn't know, he said, listen, I am going to sell this to you at cost because of what you guys are doing. So the last 15,000 masks have been at, at their cost. They're still, it's still high, <laughs> but it's still at their cost. And, but Massachusetts, they you know, reached into the manufacturers in China, and, and China basically said, listen, you can have one. You, we will sell you 1.2 million masks, but you got to get them back to the U.S. And they, they sent the plane that is owned by uh, Robert Kraft and the Patriots, and they sent it out there. China allowed it to stay on the ground for three hours. So for two hours and 57 minutes, they loaded up 1.2 million masks and that flight was on its way back to Massachusetts. So Massachusetts is covered. What has happened here is that because we, our government is fragmented right now, usually in a situation like that, all of the government, all of the different states and counties, and they all come together and try to work out a solution. What's happening right now, unfortunately, is the states are fending for themselves. And so certain states have done a better job than others in fending for themselves. And, uh, and it's unfortunate, but for us, we were concerned about making sure that the people who have been supportive of us from day one, who are the only reason we exist, that if we had any of them on the front line that were unprotected, we got them protected and we got them protected quickly. So that was our priority. And, and uh, we'll have another few hundred boxes shipping out today, another few hundred tomorrow. And, We'll keep going. I have a feeling that there's going to be a special place in hell for the price gougers when this is all said you and done. You better believe it. It is, talk about, you know, weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's a whole corner for them. So, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And and the ones holding on to ventilators for their own personal use. That's a whole other topic. The the irony is, is with us sending out all these masks, I don't, I don't have a mask. <laughs> so I've been in the house for three weeks. Because I actually don't have a mask. It's, it's important to me. I'm not on the front line. I actually have the benefit of being able to stay in the house. And uh, so that's what we're doing. 
How are your people doing at the facility in Tennessee? How are your folks holding up? They're doing fantastic. So they are, most of them, when we did the filming for for Fox Business, they were in the distillery because we had to film them all at one time. But most of them, with their masks on, with their protective gloves on, are sending these masks out from their own homes. And so everybody in our company has been working from home every single day. I tease them that we're going to need a vacation after this because we've been working everybody so hard so that they don't have time to look at all of the negativity that is on TV, all of the panic. They, they are just able to stay focused on what we are able to do in this moment and know that we are so incredibly blessed to be able to be indoors and not on the front line and that we should not take that for granted. And so our team, just like they usually do, is still working around the clock. We're just doing it from home. (laughs) And you've been able to keep all your people working around the country too, right? Oh, absolutely. We've been hiring from day one. Uh, When this happened, we had I think 11 positions open. And as soon as these mass layoffs began, uh, I posted on my own page and we posted on the Uncle Nearest pages, which we never, ever promote, uh, you know, positions that are open and things of that nature. But as the mass layoffs were happening, I wanted to encourage other CEOs to do not do this. We will be on the other side of this soon enough. We've all made money. And I know you got some in your nest egg and no, this isn't comfortable, but Let's come up with any solution but laying people off. And so we did put it out there. So we've been interviewing the entire time this has been going on by Zoom and over the phone and things of that nature. So we've got a few of those positions filled and a few in the pipeline that I think will be filled. And by the time I think we will be back out in the marketplace early May, uh, we will we will have hopefully about 12 new team members on board. And you're getting the... Uh quote, pick of the litter from everybody else's layoffs because these people are looking for somebody that's going to take care of them. And you've shown that you can do that with your staff. Absolutely. The the, the caliber of people that are applying for jobs at Uncle Nearest right now is remarkable. And I think it has to do with the fact that they know I will give up anything and everything but my people. So whatever changes we have to make, wherever we have to cut, wherever we have to do, whatever we have to do, we will do it. But we will not cut the most important part of our business, which are which are our people, our, our own internal family. By the way, the Uncle Nearest Distillery campus in Shelbyville, Tennessee, remains closed to visitors for now. And as Fawn noted during our interview... Details on how to request mask donations are available on their social media feeds on both Facebook and Instagram. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskeys, comes a single malt inspired by an original or a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's begin with the late 2019 release of High West Distilleries, a Midwinter Night's Dram. This series takes High West's Rendezvous Rye Blend and finishes it in French Oak Port Wine Barrels. The 2019 edition can be identified as Act Number 7 on the label. The nose has notes of red grapes, plums, a mild touch of baking spices, and just a hint of molasses cookies. The taste has good fruity touches of plums and raspberries, along with spicy notes of ginger, clove, and allspice, balanced by a touch of molasses in the background. The finish is long and spicy, with a hint of dark fruits, And I'm scoring the 2019 release of High West's A Midwinter Night's Dram, a 91. I mentioned Lux Rose Blood Oath Pact No. 6 a couple of weeks ago during the news and received a sample the other day. It's finished in cognac casks and bottled at 49.3% ABV. The nose has soft spices, sweeter notes of honey, caramel candy, and brown sugar, and just a touch of oak. The taste has a good balance of spices with black pepper, allspice, and a hint of cinnamon, 
complemented nicely by honey and brown sugar underneath with a touch of dried fruits. The finish, long with lingering spices, I'm scoring the Blood Oath Pact No. 6 Bourbon a 92. I'll have more tasting notes for you in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Rye whiskey was distilled by America's original risk takers and history makers. Now, those first barrels of whiskey were bold, flavorful, and full of passion. Sagamore Spirit proudly picked up the torch with their spring fed Maryland style rye whiskey. It celebrates the grit and glory of those patriotic ancestors who sipped their way into American history. Visit sagamorespirit.com to explore their award-winning spirit. Woodford Reserve recently released its annual Batch Proof Bourbon. The 2020 edition is bottled at 61.8% ABV. The nose has notes of oak, caramel, vanilla, and honey, along with hints of tobacco and leather. The taste is intense and peppery, with touches of black pepper, chili powder, and cinnamon that fade slowly to reveal honey, caramel, and brown sugar notes along with a touch of oak tannins. The finish is long and dry. I'm scoring the 2020 Woodford Reserve Batch Proof a 92. New York State distillers came up with the Empire Rye term a couple of years ago for rye whiskeys made with grain grown in the state. And one of the latest Empire Rye releases comes from Brooklyn's Kings County Distillery. It's bottled at 51% ABV. The nose is dry and just a bit dusty with good rye baking spices, touches of baked apples and banana chips, and just a hint of dark fruits. The taste has a nice balance of clove, allspice, ginger, and just a hint of dill, balanced by a soft oakiness, dried fruits, and honey. The finish, long and spicy, with hints of honey, cherries, and caramel cola. I'm scoring the Kings County Distillery's Empire Rye a 91. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. I'm adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,800 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. A whiskey from the land of always winter. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking, winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, presented by Lot 40. One of the topics that came up on our Wednesday webcast was, what's the last bottle you have that you would consider opening? And we had a couple of comments from viewers online. Judd Laughter of Knoxville, Tennessee posted this during the webcast. My last bottle to open is a basic Angel's Envy signed by Lincoln and Kyle Henderson. Well, the McAllen's Nicola Risk was one of our guests on the webcast, and she responded with this in the chat area. I have an empty bottle signed by both Lincoln and Wes. It was the first time I met them both, 2010 or 2011-ish. It's a bottle I will always keep with a blushing smile emoji, great people making great whiskey. So, tell us this week what's the last bottle you have that you'd consider opening. You can post your answers on our Facebook page, Twitter, or Instagram, and we'll share some of the answers next time around. I don't know if this has happened to you or not, but I've been going through a spell of breaking corks right and left when I'm opening up older bottles. I've probably broken six or seven of them in the last few months. It happened the other night with a 2007 bottling of Imperial Single Malt from Duncan Taylor, and when part of the cork stuck to the inside of the bottle at the shoulder, 
Well, I had to post a photo of it on social media with a minor rant about my desire to see more whiskey makers using screw caps. Just a few of the comments. My old New York City newsroom colleague and good friend Ed Caldwell shared this warning. Oh, you shouldn't drink that. Never know what's on that cork. Could corrupt your health. You should send that over here. I'll dispose of it in proper fashion. Improper if you prefer. Thanks, Ed. Lydia Calhoulligan in New Brunswick is in a similar frame of mind. You're supposed to let it mingle in the whiskey as a final finish. It's a product feature, with a winking emoji. Courtney Christiana posted this from Portland. I have been finding in recent years the texture of corks has changed because of climate change. They are more brittle and apt to breaking. I've broken way too many corks the past few years while bartending, even on brand new bottles. And Courtney included a link to an article on the effects of drought on cork growth. Chris Bader added, Ever notice how they always break near the start of a bottle, never at the end? Well, fortunately, this one was at the end. There was just a little bit of whiskey left in the bottle, so I didn't even try to strain out the cork. Just picked it out of the glass and finished off the bottle. I'm going to give the last word on this one to Ewan Shand, at Whiskey Man on Twitter. He's also the retired CEO of Duncan Taylor. Delighted to switch to screw caps, but unfortunately, the consumer expects the nice pop of a cork. Cork quality can be an issue these days, not what they used to be. We buy the best direct from the manufacturer, but this still happens. Always delighted to have consumer response. And he added, do you a dram, Mark? Thanks for the response, Ewan, and that offer, but we're good on this one. I'd had that bottle for maybe 10 or 11 years now and got a lot of enjoyment out of it over that time. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's wrap things up now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and all those other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. We've been getting so many questions on the live webcasts that we can't get to all of them, even when the webcasts go for a full 90 minutes or so. For instance, this one on Friday's webcast, with Master Blenders Billy Layton, Stephanie McLeod, and Dr. Don Livermore, that came from Jens Fischer in Rendsburg, Germany, on the sherry casks from Spain that many blenders use. The casks from Paez are fantastic in terms of craftsmanship and wood. But coming back to the sherry that seasoned the casks, how do you make sure that the wine that is used for the seasoning is of high quality? Now in his question, Jens referred to the casks from Paez. That's the Antonio Paez Cooperage in Jerez, Spain, that makes casks for Irish distillers and a number of other whiskey makers. You can get a close-up look at the cooperage in our WhiskeyCast HD video on sherry casks. It's available on YouTube and in the WhiskeyCast HD section of our website. But as for the answer to his question, like many things in life, the answer to that comes down to relationships. Whiskey makers and their coopers in Spain usually have long-standing relationships with the sherry bodegas, and they know the quality of the wines those bodegas produce. If a bodega is cutting corners on the wines it's filling into those casks, the word will get out, and they won't be doing it for long. As for the wines themselves, the bodegas don't usually differentiate between the sherries they're making for use in their own soleras and those that go into casks supplied by whiskey makers to be seasoned with sherry. That seasoning period can last for a few months or a couple of years, depending on what's been agreed to. And as for what happens to the wine, after it's been in those casks, that depends on the bodega. 
Some will take it and add it to their own Soleras, while others will take it and turn it into sherry vinegar, which many cooks like as an alternative to balsamic vinegar. By the way, if you missed last week's podcast, we talked with Rafa Cabello, a second-generation master cooper and the CEO of his family's Tunneleria del Sur Cooperage in Spain, and discussed the relationship between the Coopers and the Sherry Bodegas there as well. Jens, I'm sorry we did not get to your question on the webcast Friday. I hope this clears it up for you. And if you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot an 18th century style of premium Irish whiskey, blended from single pot still and single malt. Like yourself, it's one of life's treasured rarities, and what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links to watch our live webcasts on Wednesdays and Fridays along with our WhiskeyCast HD videos and the WhiskeyCast Tasting Panel podcast. You'll also find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. We love to hear from you. You can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2020, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink... Please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.